Now coming to the management of patients who are taking anticoagulants. Uh, before I start this, I'd just like to let you know that um, a bit of information about INR. INR is basically the international normalized ratio. What it measures is the prothrombin time. Um, and INR is basically the ratio of the patient's prothrombin time divided by the normal prothrombin time. So it just gives you an idea of how how poor the patient's uh, ble how poor the patient's clotting and coagulation may be. If the INR is higher, meaning the patient's INR is a lot more than the normal, uh, then that means it's more risk of the patient um, bleeding excessively. So um, the management of these patients differs depending on what their INR is. So if the INR is is 4 and it's stable, then is less than or equal to 4 and it's stable, then we can go ahead with pretty much any procedure. Um, and by stable, I mean, so stable has a special meaning. It means that the patient's INR has not been more than 4 uh, in the last two months, and it hasn't deviated by more than 0.5 in the last three readings. So the last three readings are within the range of 0.5. So it could be the patient could have 3, um, 3.5, and 2.5. So these three readings are fine, but if, for example, one reading is 3.5 and the other one's 2, then that means that it's not really stable. Um, but if patients have uh, more than 4 INR, or it's unstable or erratic, then we can do the safe list procedures, but, but we, which, which basically means we can do fillings, we can do supragingival scaling, but we have to delay all other procedures um, if possible. Um, and by delaying, not just delay them, but also refer the patient to the clinician who's dealing with the patient's um, clotting times. So this could be the anticoagulation clinic, the GP, the hematologist, anyone who the patient sees for this. Um, so if we can delay this, sometimes we can't really delay it. The patient urgently needs extraction, there's too much swelling, there's an incision drainage that's needed. So for these kinds of emergency treatments, we refer the patient to the OMFS department. And they, they have this, the necessary means to carry out this a procedure and make sure the patient's okay. Now, when do we check the INR? INR should be ideally checked within 24 hours of the procedure. Um, now, in all cases, patients can't always do this. They can't keep checking their INR every day. So, if the patient has generally a history of having less than four INR and it's always it's been stable, they can check up to 72 hours before the procedure. It shouldn't be any more than 72 hours before the procedure, uh, no matter how controlled their INR is. Now, if their INR is more than four, or it's been erratic, then they have to check the, the they have to check their INR 24 hours before the procedure. Okay. So, lastly, coming to some important points, uh, in patients. Uh, who take anticoagulants or those diseases that may cause bleedings that we discussed earlier, uh, we should be giving them early appointments. And by early appointments, I don't just mean early morning appointments. I also mean that the appointments should be given early in the week. Because, for example, if you give a patient a Wednesday, thurs Thursday appointment, let's say, and they have bleeding on Thursday, which is sometimes, and then they, which may sometimes happen, and then all day Thursday, and then Friday, and the clinic closes Friday and you can't really do anything about them Saturday, Sunday, so you don't want the bleeding to go on during the weekend. So ideally see them Monday, early morning, so that this, the bleeding issue can be resolved during the day. Uh, then use an aspirating syringe, a syringe and a vasoconstrictor uh, as part of the local anesthetic. Aspirating syringe because you want to make sure that you're not uh, putting the needle in the local, giving the local anesthetic in a blood vessel, which can cause excessive bleeding, and also a vasoconstrictor, of course, to make sure that there is less bleeding. Uh, do the procedures that you're doing gradually. Don't do um, so. You so in such patients, we can't do more than 
three extractions in one go, but if we're doing extractions for the first time, it has to be one extraction. In the first appointment, assess how the patient's bleeding is. And then in the next appointment, you can do up to three teeth, but no more than that. If, for example, the patient needs to get scaling done uh, and subgingival, make sure you do a small quadrant first, assess the bleeding, uh, and then you can do more. Obviously, doing quadrant quadrant is better in such patients because they may be less bleeding. So make sure the procedures are done gradually, not uh, in one, uh, not um, prolonged in one go. And we have to make sure that hemostasis, we do everything we can to achieve it. Um, and this includes making sure the procedure is atraumatic, make sure we pack with any kind of hemostatic uh, sponge material, cellulose, and then suture um, the wound afterwards. So this is specifically pretty much for extraction. Other than that, once the extraction is done, the post-op care, make sure the patient rests uh, two to three hours um, after the procedure. This will make sure that the clot stabilizes, and secondly, the anesthetic by this time will wear off. The instructions, of course, need to be given verbally and in written form. Um, and give the patient emergency contact details, your contact details, then the gap of hours also. Um, and most importantly, never give these patients any ibuprofen, aspirin, or other NSAIDs. Uh, the only uh, analgesic we can give these patients is paracetamol because ibuprofen and other NSAIDs will, will exacerbate bleeding. Um, so that's, that's, that, that may, may not be everything, but that's, I, in my opinion, everything you need to know uh, for this exam. If you have any questions, um, comment below. Thank you.